Hello, and thank you for joining us as we discuss your heart health. I'm Laura Wheatholder. I'm a registered nurse and community outreach coordinator for Blessing Health System. February 22nd is Heart Valve Disease Awareness Day. In recognition of that, we're going to discuss what heart valve disease is and an advanced treatment option available at Blessing Hospital. That tre treatment is called transcatheter aortic valve replacement, or TAVR. I'm joined today by cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. John Arnold. Dr. Arnold, thank you for joining me. Can you take a minute to introduce yourself? Uh, John Arnold. I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon here at Blessing. Uh, I'm originally from Ohio. Um, I've been in practice for 30 plus years now. Time goes by quite quickly. Uh, I've been here in uh, Quincy since uh, 2015 um, and have uh, been working with the cardiologists as well as the a heart team in the hospital to uh, provide cardiac surgery and thoracic surgery for the community. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to start with some basic information. What is heart valve disease? The heart is a muscle, as we know. It uh, contains four chambers, uh, a top right, a bottom right, a top left, a bottom left. Uh, there is essentially a door between each chamber. Um, so between the top right and the bottom right, for example, there's a door or a valve, etc. So after each chamber, a door, after the top right, a door, after the bottom right, a door, after the top left, a door, and after the bottom left, another door. I think we'll eventually get around to talking about the tavern, but what we're talking today is the door between the last chamber of the heart and the body or the aortic valve named for the aorta, the uh, blood vessel that the uh, blood is emptying into. All right. So when somebody has heart valve disease, basically one of those that aortic valve isn't functioning properly, correct? If we're talking about aortic valve disease, sure, you can have disease specific to each of the valves, but the aortic valve disease, uh, either it is too tight or it lets blood leak back through it or a combination of both. And what symptoms, if somebody was experiencing heart valve disease or maybe even aortic stenosis, what symptoms might somebody experience? Well, aortic stenosis is a stiffness of the, of the valve. Um, there are many things that lead us symptom-wise to start evaluating patients to see if they have uh, a problem, especially with that particular valve. Uh, one of the things people will often say is, well, the doctor told me I had a murmur and he's been following that for some time. Actually, the blood as it flows through the normal valve should be practically silent. It passes through there with almost no resistance. It doesn't pool or eddy or whirl after it goes through the valve and therefore it makes almost no noise. If the valve starts becoming stiff or the doors of the valve uh, don't move out of the way properly or enough, you start getting little back eddies uh, behind the doors of the valve, kind of like current around a rock in a stream. And that whirling will make a noise. So people will say, I've had a murmur in my heart for quite some time. Symptom wise, uh, sometimes with the valve getting stiffer, people will have problems with uh, their breathing becoming shorter over time. Uh, the aortic valve, uh, sometimes people will present and say, well, I thought I was getting older, you know, I just couldn't do quite as much. I couldn't get from one end of the parking lot to the other, or I couldn't get around in the store quite as well as I used to. And I just chalked it up to being older, but actually, um, you know, in this day and age, 70 is the new 40 or however you want to put it. <laughs> and so to just blindly attribute your inability to be 40 years old again, sometimes it's the valve. It, it limits the heart's ability to, put the accelerator down when it comes to getting things done. So, Okay, okay so maybe some um, increased fatigue with normal activities, things like that uh, might be a symptom of that. Now, TAVR is a treatment option for patients with heart valve disease. Can you explain a little bit about that treatment itself? Well, the ability to address the aortic valve um, began basically in the 50s uh, with uh, almost homemade, when they say off the shelf, we're, we're talking homemade uh, devices that surgeons would put together by 
literally cutting uh, like snaffle lids, the, the rubber things, and they would suspend them in uh, rings. And it became much more sophisticated through the 60s and 70s. Um, but those procedures, those devices required a surgical procedure to put them in place. The aortic valve, as it is, the natural aortic valve sits right at the top of the heart. And we go through the chest and um, stop the heart and cut out the old valve and put in the new valve. Uh, and that's a very well-developed procedure. It's a very uh, a mature procedure. We don't expect uh, anything but predictable results from that. Uh, in the early 2000s, in Europe especially, uh, it began, um, there began to be uh, the possibility or the devices available where like people get stents in the blood vessels of their heart, they get effectively a stent in where this aortic valve lives. And so instead of me as a surgeon being uh, necessarily required to open up your chest and, and do this uh, procedure as an open surgery, the TAVR procedure uh, is done with catheters and wires basically. And we are able to place a prosthesis, a device, uh, through the old bad valve and uh, expand that TAVR valve uh, in place and it will do uh, the job of the valve that is being replaced. So we, we move the old valve to the side and we have a new valve in place and that should be, um, you know, the goal there is to have it be as effective as the um, healthy valve would have been uh, had it stayed healthy. What does a recovery from TAVR versus maybe somebody who's had a traditional surgical valve replacement look like? Um, how do they differ, the recovery? Yes, the um, choosing patients uh, for TAVR is still not a straightforward thing. Not every patient should have a TAVR. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, the procedure was uh, immature, uh, required tremendous resources to uh, get a patient through a given procedure, uh, the delivery devices, the size of the devices, the competence of the devices uh, varied widely. And in fact, the incisions we used to have to make to put these in place were uh, quite dramatic, actually. And there were a lot of complications, even at the level of where we put these through the leg arteries. Uh, some of the tavers early on, we had to open up the chest to do it. Uh, it was a lesser hole, but still through the chest and through the muscle of the heart. The current technology, and one of the reasons TAVR is becoming more and more uh, widespread, uh, is um, the shrinkage, basically, of these devices. Uh, uh, they've become smaller, and so we're able to place them through special catheters in the arteries to the leg without a very high expectation of causing damage to those arteries or having trouble down the road. Um, some people are uh, not considered appropriate for TAVR currently. Actually, they, if you're younger and healthier, uh, we still don't have uh, a, a long experience with the TAVRs here or anywhere. And so we don't typically put them in uh, young people that for whatever reason need a valve at this time. It varies quite a bit. I mean, the, the people coming here for TAVR or anywhere uh, undergo a fairly rigorous uh, evaluation to make sure it's appropriate. And there are different um, styles of these TAVRs, so we want to make sure we put in the one that's most appropriate for the individual. Circling back to your question, if we have a straightforward procedure using just the groin access going through the arteries of the leg, uh, we would expect people to go home uh, sometimes the day after, generally more an expectation of a couple days after, um, the uh, population that is eligible for this procedure tends to be older and sicker to begin with. And so sometimes those comorbidities hang us up a little bit in terms of getting people discharged to home. The recovery period we talk about having an advantage uh, around is that we would expect these people to be uh, up and at them and um, we don't want to do certain things because we have put some uh, generous uh, incisions in the arteries of their, of their legs. We don't expect them to pop or anything like that, but uh, from a precautionary standpoint, we limit their activities, at least from a recommendation standpoint, for a couple of weeks. Uh, 
they generally feel pretty good inside of a few days. They're kind of, oh, I got that done. You know, it's 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 not a dental procedure, and it's not getting a little thing flicked off your back. But uh, we would expect people to uh, bounce back from the procedural um, events uh, quite quickly, a couple days with a, a general recovery a couple weeks. And now you've kind of talked about um, a little bit about, you know, patient selection and things like that um, and touched on a little bit, but TAVR is more than just a procedure. Blessing Heart and Vascular Center has worked to develop a, a really comprehensive program that starts with uh, appropriate patient selection and um, making sure that the patient is right for the procedure. Can you explain a little bit more about the team approach and what someone can expect if they are a candidate for TAVR? Well, step one, of course, is identification of somebody who has aortic valve disease that may be appropriate for aortic valve replacement. And uh, that is uh, a phenomenon that, that typically happens, you know, again, like I started out the story, they, they have a murmur or the primary care doc notes a few of the things that we kind of keep an eye on. Uh, obviously, many people have a murmur for quite a while when you, when you don't do anything about it. And people will say, oh, now he wants me to do A, B, C, and D. Well, he's he or she is watching certain parameters that um, give us an indication that that valve has finally gotten bad enough that we need to start our evaluation for a more aggressive or more assertive uh, correction of the valve. That, um, like you said, is handled by a team here. Uh, typically, the patient will be referred in either to myself, uh, surgery, or to cardiology. Most of the workup is initiated within our cardiology department, the way we have things arranged here. Um, to go into all those steps is is kind of longer than we need to explain. I mean, basically, there's a there's a pretty set algorithm uh, and a series of tests that are done here and everywhere in order to make sure the patient is appropriate for the procedure and that we are doing the right uh, type of TAVR procedure. And sometimes we say that the person may need to be uh, more strongly considered for a surgical approach, or we may find other disease that needs to be addressed at the same time, which also may tip them over into a surgical approach. Um, but uh, team wise, uh, we have the cardiologists from uh, both Blessing and the uh, Quincy Medical Group, uh, myself, the cardiac surgeon. Uh, we have uh, nurse practitioners that have specialty training and specialty skills in terms of uh, going through the, the testing regimen and the education that is involved uh, on the front end of these uh, procedure that place these TAVR valves. Um, there's actually uh, quite a large group of people. If, if we counted up everybody that touches each of these TAVR patients, it, it would turn into a 50 or 60 person collection, uh, many of them behind the scenes taking, taking care to uh, execute these various assessment protocols, you know, perfectly. So we know exactly who's uh, going to get the uh, procedure, that they are the appropriate ones to get the procedure. And then when we do the procedure, that the procedure is done with perfection. Is there anything about um, TAVR or aortic valve disease or valve disease, I should say, not just aortic valve disease, but valve disease that you would like to add to the conversation today? Anything that we didn't touch on? Well, it's a very broad topic. Uh, perhaps maybe we can come back at some later date and we can go through the various valves and the various disease states. Um, I think it's important for patients to, one, listen to their physician or their healthcare um, uh, person you know, uh, the advanced practice people or uh, their physician. And uh, as well, they need to listen to their body. If they if they understand that uh, something has changed, then they need to be evaluated uh, formally and uh, give the uh, physician or the healthcare practitioner uh, the opportunity to um, determine if it's appropriate for them to have a more aggressive evaluation carried out. 
All right. Well, as you said, it's a very broad topic, but we do have more information available um, and you can find that information, more information about heart health services available through Blessing Health System and the TAVR procedure um, on our website, blessinghealth.org. Dr. Arnold, thank you for joining us today and be sure to log on to blessinghealth.org to find more information. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much.